Good morning, Resonate Church. We're so glad you're joining us in your homes this morning. Let's praise the name of Jesus. When night has fallen, when fear is coming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost in, my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. I've decided I'm not giving up, cause you won't give up on me. You won't give up on me. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. I feel it breaking down like an echo. Holding on and it won't let go I feel it breaking out like an echo Echo in my soul So In every season You keep repeating Promises to me
and we're worshiping him and we're so glad that you've joined us today we've been praying for you that God would be speaking to you and that your voice lifted up in praising him it honors him it lifts him up so we're so glad you've come to be a part of our worship service and if you're a guest today we want to especially welcome you and today's a great day for you to be a part of our worship service because immediately following our service we're gonna have a guest reception virtually it's gonna be on zoom just a click on a link on your computer and you can hear Pastor Ryan share the vision of Resonate Church. We want to hear your story a little bit just to get to know you. It's a great first step if you're a guest here. You can find that Zoom link on our online services webpage by going to www.resonatemovement.org forward slash online services. Can't wait to see you there. So many of you remember just a few weeks ago, 
when we celebrated 18 people taking a step of discipleship by getting baptized here at Resonate, an exciting and amazing day, hearing stories of lives that have been transformed by the grace of Jesus. It was so inspiring that more people have joined in, getting baptized in their homes, and we get to see them today on this next video to look and see people following Christ with their life. So uh, I'm honored to do this today, Tim, and uh, uh, tell me, have you put your trust and faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I have. Based on your profession of faith, I will now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Church, wasn't that amazing? We just celebrated life change. And it's all because of the name of Jesus Christ. So let's continue to worship Him this morning. We need no other hiding place. My hope is safe within your name. This we know. This we know. Never to forsake what you began, you will sustain. This we know, this we know.
Resonate Church. For those of you who are new to our campus, welcome. We know you're visiting us online. Some of you for the first time, so glad that you're here. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. My name is Will Medell. I'm the pastor of our Hayward location. We're in the middle of a series called Fight, and this is the third week of that series, but I can catch you up very quickly. There's a battle going on right now, and perhaps as you're just hearing those words, maybe you felt it. You for sure feel it on social media. Maybe you feel it in your family, and possibly you even feel it in yourself. And what the scriptures would tell us is that there is a cosmic battle going on right now. But this battle isn't against different people. There's actually a battle going on between the devil and all his evil angels and the people of God, and the devil wants to ruin you. Now, last week, Pastor Ryan shared with us that although Satan is powerful, he's not God. He's not all powerful. He doesn't know everything. And God has given the church tools to resist the devil. As a matter of fact, as you've been listening to this series, perhaps you've been thinking, man, I want some tools. You've agreed with Pastor Ryan and said, yeah, please show me how to fight the devil. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about a powerful weapon that God has given to the church so that we can not just stand, not just defend ourselves, but actually go on the offense. And here's something I know about weapons, though. If you were to give Will Medell a sword, I mean, my mom would think I look cool, but like, I'm not Mulan. I don't know how to use that thing. It would be really awful. See, in essence, I don't know how to use a sword. I'd be, if there was a battle and you gave me a sword, I would be of no use to you whatsoever. And brothers and sisters, as I think about our church, I see a lot of brothers and sisters who are unarmed. Even if they are armed, maybe they're untrained, And since those two are true, we're unprepared for this battle. And it's scary because we're in a fight. You see, it's not just that there are bodies piling up all around us, that people are getting injured. It's that Jesus, when he talks about the church, he says that the gates of hell will not prevail, meaning that the church is an unstoppable force and we're supposed to be on offense. And so if we don't have our weapons, there's no way we can make headway. And today, God wants to speak to us. And so I want to invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. We're in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to put it on the board here for you. Ephesians chapter 6. It's the same verse that we've been in for the last few weeks because we're talking about the spiritual battle. So let's look at it. Here's what Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. And to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth to boldly proclaim the mystery of the gospel. That is the word of the Lord for us this morning. And all God's people said, amen. Put it in the comments. Amen. All right. Now, we see in this passage that the church is called to pray. (laughs) Every Christian knows that, right? You know you're supposed to pray, but the truth is we often don't pray. So I want to, before we start talking about the passage, I want us to be on the same page. Why don't we pray? And as I do this, please understand that I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I've looked at my own heart. I've looked at my own soul and asked these questions. And so here are some reasons that I've come up with, with why we don't pray. Here's the first one. Maybe you're too busy or maybe you're too tired. Can we just agree that we are tired before COVID started? 
And now with COVID and having to be sheltered in place, and oh my goodness, if you have kids at home and now you're a full-time employee and you're a full-time teacher, it is exhausting. Last week was the first week of school. And so on Saturday morning, I slept till 11.30. I kid you not. I woke up, made lunch, and went back to sleep at 1 and slept till 5.30. Brothers and sisters, I am exhausted. This is one of the reasons that I have in my head as to why I don't pray. Here's the second reason. Often we think, well, if we pray, it doesn't really work anyway. Can we be honest about that? Can, if that's your frustration, you've prayed for that person in your small group to change. You've prayed for your, your spouse. You've prayed for your children. You don't see any change whatsoever. And if we're honest, our hearts are telling us, well, why should we pray? It actually doesn't work. The third reason is this. Even though we've been in the series called Fight, a lot of us don't believe that we're in a battle. A lot of us don't think that Satan is real. And so we don't see the things happening around us and therefore we don't have a reason to pray. But if I boil it all down, I think it's this last reason that really convicts me. This is what nails Will Medell is this, is that really prayer is not a priority for me. Prayer is not a priority. And listen, I have the safety of the gospel, meaning I trust in Jesus' righteousness over my own. So I can be honest with you. I can tell you that because, <laughs> because I'm tired and because I have a track record of not seeing the prayers answered the way that I want them to be seen and because I don't really think that we're in a battle, often I'm not making this a priority. But here's the problem. This is one of the best weapons that God has given us and yet I'm leaving it unused. And so I believe that God wants to give us this text. He wants to give us this text to answer two important questions. And here's the first one. The first one is this. If God's calling us to pray, well, how should we do it? How do we pray? Well, let's look at the passage because Paul's gonna tell us. Paul writes to the church in verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now remember, we've been talking about that for the last three weeks. But here's where we get to the weapon. Paul says you should be praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. And to that end, what you should do is keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to what? To proclaim the gospel, right? And to proclaim the mystery of this gospel to the church. Now, like I said, maybe for the last few weeks, you've heard Pastor Ryan say that we're in a fight, you believe it, and you're like, please equip me. What am I supposed to do? Well, we'll answer this first question. How should we pray? Paul answers it for us. And I'm going to put one verse up here on the screen for you. This is verse 18. And I want to give you some hints today as how to study the scriptures. Anytime an author is repeating a word, anytime an author is going over something, he's emphasizing it for you. They're saying, this is really important. Don't miss it. And in this passage, there are two different things that are repeated four times. I only highlighted one because I don't want to confuse you. Paul says, Christian, you should be praying at all times. That means not just always, but in every season. You should be praying all prayer and supplication with all perseverance for all saints. That's the first one that he uses four times, the first word. But then he uses prayer or a word like prayer four different times. He says, you should be praying and pray and supplicate. Supplication just means to beg. That's actually a very technical term that is used in religion back in the day that meant to beg God because you know that God is the only one that can answer your prayer. But then he also talks about making more supplication. It's another begging for all the saints. What is Paul saying? <laughs> Paul says, pray at all times, have all prayer, all perseverance for all saints. And you might say, P Paul, why are you all extreme, man? Like, don't you know I already feel guilty about this? I already know. My parents tell me I'm supposed to pray. My Sunday school teacher told us we're supposed to pray. My amp leader have told me you're supposed to pray. I don't think Paul's trying to make us feel guilty. I think he's emphasizing something. He's letting us know, church, we're in a fight. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, which we started with, is the context. We're in this spiritual battle. And so he's telling us, remember, we have an adversary. He's not more powerful than God, but he's powerful nonetheless. So he's answering that first question, how should we pray? How should the Christian pray? A pr Christian should pray with desperation. A Christian should pray with desperation, okay? This is why he's saying all so often. We should pray 
all the time, in every season, in every way. We should pray just to know God and talk to him, but we should pray to beg. We should be praying for different kinds of things and we should be praying for all kinds of people. And the reason why Paul is telling us this, the reason why we should be desperate is because this is our greatest offensive weapon. And brothers and sisters, if this is our weapon, if I were to compare it to a sword and I look at our prayer life or the prayer life of the church, the church has their sword sheathed. We have that weapon just stuck there. We're not using it. Now, why is that? I think the reason is because we think too highly of ourselves and not high enough of God. I think Silicon Valley has infected us. I think we think that we can do it. And pastors throughout the ages have used this passage to point the people of God to the fact that we are not in control but we know somebody who does. I want to show you a pastor. Here's what he writes about this. He says, now notice the wisdom of this blessed apostle. He's kind of an old dude. Paul has armed them with the armor of God. Next week, Pastor Ryan's going to talk about that. This is what we're talking about, this next part. What then after the armor is necessary is to call upon the king, that the king would stretch forth his hand. What's this pastor's point? Jesus is king. <laughs> every hour, every minute, Every second, pray each and every millisecond, we need him. We need him. And we need to understand that we are not the Messiah. When we understand that we serve the Messiah, we will become desperate and pray in every situation, at all time, in every season. We'll want to talk to God because we love him, but we'll also want to beg God for help because we know that we need help in the battle. And so what does this look like? Well, we're going to pray when we're happy or when we're sad. We're going to pray when the sky is blue or when the sky is orange. We're going to pray as kindergartners. We're going to pray as old people. We're going to pray through the pain and we're going to pray through the joy. And the reason we're going to do that is because we're desperate and we know that God is the king and we're not. And he has the ability to answer all prayer. You better put amen in that comment section. Jesus is king. We're not the king. And if you study the New Testament, this is exactly what you see in the New Testament. Man, the New Testament church, they didn't trust in their governance. They didn't trust in, the, in Rome. They didn't trust in the government to change their problems. They didn't trust in a slick mission statement. They didn't trust their slick preachers. They trusted God and it showed in their prayer life. Look at the New Testament time and time again. The early church, when they're persecuted, they pray. Jesus tells the church, this is the kind of faith that God is looking for, a faith that continually reaches out to God in prayer. Paul has no problem telling Christians all around the world, would you please pray for me? Peter reminds Christians all around the world, keep praying, the devil is out there. And in the book of Revelation, when you look at the prayers of the saints, what is it noted as? What's the symbol? It's incense, it's worship. Why is prayer worship? Because it shows that we trust God. God is king and not us. Now listen, if we realize that we're in a battle, <laughs> we're in a battle and we don't have anything to give to this battle, our own flesh and blood can't fight in this battle, then we're gonna reach out for the king who's in control. We know that we need some help and so we're going to pray. But the truth is, my brothers and sisters, we're not desperate. Let's be honest about it. We're not desperate. I'll tell you how you know if you're desperate. This last week, a movie came out on Disney Plus, Mulan. Some of you got it. And there's a scene in there right before Mulan goes into battle. And you can tell that she's tripping. How can you tell? Well, you can tell because her hand's shaking and she has to stop it. My brothers and sisters, the truth is our hand isn't shaking. We haven't understood that we're in a battle. And once we do, once we're desperate, we're going to pick up this weapon to fight. Because like I said, this is not a defensive struggle. We're not under siege. Christ has called the church to go make disciples of all the world. And Christ has promised us that the gates of hell that are standing in Fremont, in Hayward, in Richmond, in the Bay Area will not stand against the unstoppable force of the church. But that's not our posture, is it? We're just not desperate. Why is that? Why aren't we desperate? Well, the answer might surprise you. It actually leads to the second way that Christians should pray. The second way that Christians should pray is this. Christians should pray for alertness. Now, if you're just joining us, you might say, that's really weird. 
Where'd you get that one from? That, you're kind of coming out of left field. I'm not. Because if you remember, this whole series is about fight. Fight against the schemes of the devil. We have a crafty enemy. And I want to show you scripturally why this is what Paul tells us to pray for. Let's look at the passage. Paul says we should be praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication and to that end to keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. We covered the alls, but I want to show you a very important phrase. Paul says it, to that end. Why should we be praying at all times? Why should we have all prayer and supplication? Whenever you see this phrase to that, to that end or the apostle or somebody will say, this is why, you want to pay attention to that. They're telling you this is why you're doing thing A so that you can get thing B. And Paul says we should be praying so that we can keep alert. This is a very big deal. Now, it's not a big deal for us because we don't understand what alertness is. But in Paul's day, they did. See, for us, after we make dinner and put the dishes away and put the kids to bed or whatever you do at night, you're going to go to sleep and you're not going to worry at all. But that wasn't the reality of the New Testament times. There were soldiers around. There was always an enemy. There was always a chance that somebody was going to come and take out your town in the middle of the night. So what did soldiers have to do? Remember, Paul's using soldier metaphor here. Soldiers had to keep watch. And even to this day, if you're in the military, there are still times where you have to keep watch. And it's one of the most important things that you're supposed to do. Soldiers in the middle of the night take turns watching out for the enemy. And one of the worst things you can do is fall asleep during your watch. It doesn't matter if the enemy comes or not. If it's found out that you fall asleep during your watch, you are in big trouble. You could possibly lose your life, okay? Because it's that serious. You must keep watch. You must not fall asleep. And my brothers and sisters, the devil has lulled us to sleep. The devil has lulled us to sleep. He lulls us to sleep with comfort. He lulls us to sleep with endless entertainment. Under most circumstances, he lulls us to sleep with sports. Some of y'all were watching Kansas City this week, right? And you don't even care about that, but you were so jonesing for football, you watched that. And last Saturday, you were watching some Division three football, okay? The devil is lulling us to sleep. And Paul says, one of the reasons we're supposed to pray is to wake up. Wake up. Wake up and realize what the devil is doing. Now, you, again, you might, you might not be convinced. You might think, man, well, you're just kind of pulling. No, I'm going to give you another passage in another part of scripture. Look at what Peter says. This is 1 Peter, not Ephesians 6. Peter says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Humble yourself. Go to God. What does that sound like? You're going to him, right? Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. This verse is a great explanation of how to pray. How should you pray? Go to God humbly. Submit yourself. He's the mighty one. He's the king. Just like we were talking about. Cast all your anxieties. Make supplication because he cares for you. That's the gospel. But notice, Peter doesn't just say pray. He's going to tell us why to pray. Look at this next path. Very next word. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. He's looking for someone to devour. You have to resist him. Be firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering is being experienced by your brothers and sisters all throughout the world. <laughs> Peter's putting together prayerfulness and watchfulness because he knows even though Peter's not Paul, even though they're in different parts of the world, the early church understood one of the biggest reasons why the church is not active is because we're asleep. And the way to wake us up is to pray. The way to wake us up is to pray. Because if we pray, if we talk to the God of the universe, if we beg him, if we go to him for strength, we know that he's going to answer. And God is telling us, church, wake up. Wake up. It's time to cast your anxieties upon Jesus because he cares. And so I want to ask a question this morning. Actually, not a question. I want to make a statement. And I want us to pray through this. I want to say, Jesus, show me where I'm asleep. I'm going to take a time out. 
And I'm going to pray. And as I do, I want to give us some space. And listen, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, God has given you a beautiful gift called the Holy Spirit. You could say something very quickly. Just spirit, show me. So let's pray, church. God, forgive us for falling asleep. God, we're asleep. We've fallen into the traps of the devil. And God, wake us up. Holy Spirit, we believe that you speak. We know that you will speak. Would you speak to the church right now? Church, take a moment to pray. God, we know that we're your children because of what Christ has done. Not because we pray, not because we're perfect, not because of the things that we do, but because of what Christ has done. And so God, we trust that you will keep speaking to us. God, even if we have not discerned how we've fallen asleep right now, would you please speak to us throughout the day? Because God, we want to wake up. We want to wake up. Would you do that in the name of Christ Jesus? Amen. Listen, once you wake up, Paul's not done yet. He says, praying Christians should be praying with desperation. That Christians should pray so that they can be alert. But there's one other reason why they pray according to this passage. There's other passages in the New Testament. But in this one, there's one other thing that he says we should do. We should pray. How we should pray is we should pray for others. We should pray for others. Now, I want to give you specifics here because we're going to look at a verse that has a word. If you came from a certain kind of church, you might have a different definition of what this word is. And the word is saints. Now, I understand that. I actually grew up Catholic. I was a Eucharistic minister. I was an altar boy. I almost studied to become a priest, Capuchin priest, by the way. And I understand how you understand that a saint is somebody who's maybe in heaven that's praying for us. But in the New Testament, every time you see the word saint, saint is just a translation of a Greek word, hagios, which means the holy ones. And so whenever Paul talks about the saints, he's talking about Christians. So listen to this. This is really important. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, brother and sister, you are a saint. Whatever you think of those people up in the sky, that's you. Not because of what you've done, but because of what Christ has done. And furthermore, when you look at the New Testament, you see Paul writing to the saints of a certain city. So Paul couldn't be writing to people who are in heaven, right? He's writing to the Christians that are in Rome or the Christians that are in Ephesus. And brother and sister, how that would change our prayer life if we believed that we were saints but it also changed the way that we pray for other saints. Look at what Paul says. Paul says, this is what we should be doing. Praying in the spirit at all times with all prayer and supplication to keep alert with perseverance, making deep begging, like pray hard. Oh my gosh, God, you're the only one. That's what supplication means. You're the only one that can do it for the saints. This is what Paul's telling the church to do that we should be begging for the saints. And here's what Paul's reminding us of. Brother and sister, if you're part of the church, you're part of a large body of believers. We're all on the same team. We're all fighting for the same cause. And that cause is Jesus Christ, nothing else. That we are all brothers and sisters. We're closer to one another than we are to our own flesh and blood who do not know Jesus Christ. That's what the scriptures would tell us. And what Paul says is, listen, if we're all God's holy people, then your burden is my burden. My burden is your burden. Your victory is my victory. And my victory is your victory. If you're weeping because your kids are lost, I'm weeping with you. And more important than all of that is the fact that we're in a battle and we're waging against the gates of hell. And since that's true, let's pray for one another. Listen, man, Paul ain't too proud to beg. Look at verse 19. Here's what Paul writes. He says, and while you're praying for the saints, pray for me. Church, would you pray for me? Would you, would you pray for your staff? Would you pray for Pastor Ryan for his protection? But notice, not just pray, pray what? For offense. Pray that words would be given to me so that I can open my mouth 
boldly. I want you to pray that for me. Every time I talk to somebody in Hayward that I would preach the gospel to them. Boldly to proclaim the mysteries of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. And that I would declare it boldly. He says it twice. There's that emphasis. Because I should. Because I should. Man, if there was one dude in history that should not have needed any prayer coverage, who was it? Come on, man, it's Paul. Paul was preaching the gospel all throughout the Roman world. He went through all kinds of persecutions. He started many different churches. He wrote like a third of the New Testament. If there was ever a guy who did not need any prayer support, it should have been Paul. And what is Paul doing here? He says, pray for me. He says, pray for me. And brothers and sisters... You should have the same boldness. You should have the same boldness to go to somebody in your MC, your small group, your missional community that we're going to start pretty soon, or somebody that's been in your MC in the past and say, would you pray for me? You should have boldness to go to your spouse and say, pray for me. Children, you should go to your parents. I know, I know your parents are tough on you sometimes. I know they don't understand. But listen, you should go to your parents and say, I don't understand what's happening right now and I'm stuck. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? Now listen, I told you that one of the reasons we don't pray is because we don't think it doesn't work. And I feel that way sometimes. And this week I was preparing this message on Monday and I'm, I'm reading everything. I'm reading commentaries. I'm digging it, man. I love it. I'm, I, I'm just kind of a nerd. I love getting into the text. I love reading old pastors. It's just good. And all of a sudden as I was reading, I noticed that my heart started getting angry, like really angry. And I started snapping at my wife and my kids and I'm, I'm sorry, family, I'm really sorry. I, I, I was just angry. And so I thought, oh, well, I'm preaching a sermon. I'm being alert to the devil's schemes. I'm gonna be a good Christian, I'm gonna pray. And so I prayed and the anger got worse, <laughs> which is crazy. The anger got worse. I'm like, okay, I'm supposed to tell these people that prayer works. And then it kind of dawned on me, the rest of this passage where Paul is asking the church, would you pray for me? And one of the brothers that I text is right in the back of the sanctuary right now. I texted three brothers and I said, I'm not doing well. My house is not good. And I need your help. I need your prayer. And I, I tell you, in like two or three minutes, these brothers, zzz, 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 I got responses. They're saying, we got you, bro. We're praying for you. We're praying for you. But even more encouraging than them sending me a text back saying, we're praying for you. Within five minutes, I felt that anger lift. My brothers and sisters, that's prayer. That's my brothers going into battle for me. Prayer works. Ask somebody to pray for you. Listen, in Acts chapter 12, you can go read this on your own. The apostle, Paul, apostle Peter was in jail. He was about to be executed for his faith. And he saw one of his friends got executed three days prior. He was scared, okay? And this is a pillar of the church and the church was freaking out. So what did the church do? Did they go demonstrate? No, not against demonstrating, but that's not what they did. Did they go tell the governor to let him go? No. Did they try to bribe? No. You know what the church did? They prayed. They prayed and miraculously, Peter was released from jail. And let me stop you right now because your brain might be thinking, well, that was the New Testament. That can't happen right now. My brothers and sisters, this prayer ability that was given to Peter in the early church is the same ability that God gives to resonate church. It's the same Jesus Christ. We are part of that church universal. We must be a praying people. And so if we listen to Paul, we see three things. We see that a Christian is one that prays with desperation. We see that a Christian is somebody who prays so that we can become alert. And we see that a Christian is somebody who prays for other people. So what are you waiting for? Go do it. Ah, see, that's, that's guilt, man. Guilt doesn't work. Some of you already feel guilty. As you've heard me preaching, you feel guilt and shame. And let me tell you, guilt and shame will never help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is why we must preach the good news. Good news is gospel. Gospel is good news. And good news is something that happened in the past. And what we need to do is look at what Jesus did. What's the good news about Jesus' work that would make us pray? Well, if we look at what Christ did and we believe it, it's going to give us a posture of prayer. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make us want to pray. And so I want to talk about, man, what is your posture in prayer? How does God want you to go about this thing? Not just how to do it, but what, like, what's the swagger? 
How does he want you to enter into this amazing, amazing weapon? Well, here's the first thing. I think God wants us to have this posture. He wants us to pray with power. He wants us to pray with power. Remember, what's Paul saying to the church? Is he saying, pray with all your might? Is he saying, hey, it's up to you. Go, home, go big or go home? No way. Remember last week, Pastor Ryan said, on, on the internet, there's always this meme of like Jesus arm wrestling Satan. And like it says, hey, if you pray, then Jesus is gonna go over the top. Man, that is not the battle that's happening, okay? Jesus does not need my prayers. I need him. And God knows that we're human, Listen, don't feel any guilt if you have a bad prayer life right now, okay? God knows you're human. God knows that you sin. God knows this so much that he's actually given us himself. Look at the encouragement in this passage. Paul writes, finally, brother and sister, be strong in Jesus and in Jesus' strength. How do we do that? We pray, but how? Praying at all times in the spirit, in the spirit. God doesn't say fake it till you make it. God says pray in the spirit. And if you don't know, the spirit of God is one of those amazing gifts, one of those implications of the gospel that when Jesus died for you, he, want, he didn't just take all your sin away and give you all his righteousness. He did that. But one of the implications is that he actually allows his spirit to live inside of you. This is why in Corinthians, Paul says, don't don't mistreat the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Because your body's the Spirit's temple. The Spirit is living in you. John would write, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Spirit is in you. And since the Spirit's in you, what God has said is that, man, pray with my might. Pray with my power. Let me pray through you. And before you get convicted that like, well, you're not Pastor Ryan or you're not like your MC leader or you're not like your grandma who goes to prayer meetings. No, no. This is not a super Christian thing. This is a Christian thing. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, all you have to do is yield your life to him and say, God, I'm weak. Would you pray through me? Now, if you're not convinced, I want to show you. This is how committed God is to your prayer life. Look at what, what Paul writes in Romans. He says, likewise, the spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Are you weak in your I am. Help me, Spirit. How? We don't know what to pray for. That sounds like me too. We don't know what we should pray for or how we ought to do it. But the Holy Spirit himself prays. <laughs> the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. How does he do it? He does it with groanings. It's so deep. We don't even have words for it. And he who searches the heart knows what's in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for you, Holy One, according to to the will of God. What great news. Even when I don't know what to say, even when I don't have anything to say, the spirit of God is praying for me. Oh my goodness, that is good news. And so the question that you might be asking is, well, how do I do it? Well, remember, Peter gave us a template, right? He said, humble yourself. Go before, let God lift you up. <laughs> don't think too highly of yourself. Go to the king, ask him, beg, believe what Christ did for you and that you have this right, this right to the Holy Spirit to bring anything to mind. There's no formula to it, but if I were to put it to words, I would just say something as simple. See if any of these prayers resonate with you. Holy Spirit, I don't know what to pray for. That's a great prayer. I don't know what to pray for, but for the next five minutes, use me. Holy Spirit, I've been working on this sin. I'm addicted. I don't know what to do. Would you bring somebody into my life? Would you show me how to? That's a great prayer. Holy Spirit, I've been living next to my neighbor for five years and I've never shared the gospel with them. Would you give me an opportunity? That's a great prayer. That's a great prayer. And here's the good news. You don't need to be a prayer warrior to use those. What is a prayer warrior? No, all you have to do is believe that Jesus is who he said he was. And because he died for you, you now have the Holy Spirit in you so that you could pray with desperation, so that you could pray for alertness, so that you could pray for others, but so that you could pray with power. And if you believe this, brothers and sisters, you will pray. If you believe that the Spirit of God is moving in you and uses you, you'll pray. But there's one other posture, and this is my favorite. We're going to end with this. 
The Christian prays with righteousness. The Christian prays with righteousness. Now, again, this sounds really weird, but let me explain it. Because you see, the essence of the gospel is Christ does what I cannot And the thing that I cannot do is cleanse myself. I'm too sinful. I'm too evil. I do too many things wrong. But on the cross, God treated Jesus as if he were me. And now God treats me as if I were Jesus. This is the essence of the gospel. That is the gospel. But here's the implication. The implication of that is this. The Bible describes the place where God dwells as his throne room. Okay, now this was a great name for most of human history, but for us, it doesn't really work because we don't have a king anymore. But all throughout history, kings had exclusive places where only the king could go and his inner court. And this room was completely cut off from the rest of the world. As a matter of fact, if you remember an old story about Esther, she was queen of the land, and yet she even did not have the right to go into the throne room. She had to be invited into by the king. And so notice what the author of Hebrews says now about the righteousness of Christ and who we are. The author writes, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places or the throne room, by what? By how good you did? By how often you pray? By how much you read your Bible? By how much you taught? No, by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the new and living way that Jesus opened for us. What did he do? Through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have such a great priest over the house of God, that's Jesus, let us draw near with the true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Man, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering because the one who promised, he's faithful. Do you know why I don't go near to God? If I'm honest, the biggest reason why I don't go near to God is because I actually know who God is. God is in heaven. God is in his throne room. He's perfectly holy. He's surrounded by angels crying out, holy, holy, holy. And I know who I am. I'm not holy. I could never do enough to enter into his throne room. But Jesus, (laughs) but thanks be to God that Jesus paid a high price to take every single one of my sins and nail it to the cross so that when God sees me, I'm able to go into dad's throne room and talk to him at the very seat of the universe, the seat of power. I have access to that because of what Christ has done. I don't have to wonder like Esther. Esther said, I don't know if the king will accept me. I can go with pure confidence. And brother and sister, you can too. If you're in Christ Jesus, you have full assurance. The curtain is split open. Dad is waiting for you on his throne. He's reigning and he says, come here. Come talk to me. Let me help you in this battle. Let me change the world through you. Come and spend time with me. This is why I sent my son to die for you. And brother and sister, I don't have that access because I'm a pastor. I have that access because of Jesus Christ. And you do too. So brothers and sisters, let us boldly enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus Christ with the righteousness that he gave us and pray and pray, dear Lord, your kingdom come in the Bay Area just as it is in heaven. So I wanna end with prayer. That's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna walk you to the Father's throne room. And there's nothing special about this. You can open up a Bible and you can pray all the things that I'm gonna pray. You can start with Isaiah chapter six and you can say, I'm there because of the righteousness of Christ. And once I get us there, brother and sister, I want you to pray for three things. Pray that God would help you be desperate, that you would pray always. Pray that Christ would wake you up, that you would no longer be sleeping and pray for whatever saint comes to your mind. I'm gonna lead us there. I'll give us some open space. I'll direct you in prayer and then I'll finalize it after those three prayers. Let's pray. Jesus, because of your righteousness, we come running. We come running into the Father's court, into his throne room. God, how amazing that we could be here with you. You're the king of the universe. 
And yet you call us your daughter, you call us your son because of what Christ has done, we believe it. And Holy Spirit, we are not strong enough or able to pray the prayers that we should pray. But here's what we know. We are not a praying church. Spirit, would you change that? God, would you show us right now the angel circling your throne, crying out, holy, 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 that we are there, we're in the epicenter of the universe, your throne room. Lord, let my brothers and sisters believe it and enjoy it. And now, God, as a church, we want to pray for three things. Here's the first one. God, would you make us desperate? Would we become a praying people? Would we pray at all times with all prayer and supplications for all saints? Church, take a moment to pray for that first prayer. God, show us how to pray at all times in every season. But secondly, God, would you wake us up? God, Spirit, open our eyes to see where we've been asleep and forgive us for that sin. God, would you bring something to mind right now? Would you preach to your church in words stronger than I could ever imagine? Holy Spirit, wake us up. Church, take some time to pray. Just pray, Jesus, show me where I'm asleep. And now finally, brothers and sisters, let us pray for the saints. Let us pray for the brothers and sisters that are on the front line. Pray for your MC leader, pray for your staff members, pray for the Res Kids staff, pray for AMP small group leaders, pray for your cousins, pray for anybody who is in this battle. Whoever the Lord brings to your mind, church, take some time right now to pray for the saints. God, we pray these things with great confidence because our confidence is in Jesus. Our confidence is that you're the king, that you're on the throne, that you reign one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Come on, Resonate Church. Let's become a praying church.
darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence me. worship services, weekly communion, and even though we'll be doing that online. The reason is because in communion, we show the sense of unity, that we are together communing in Christ as one church. So we want to inform you so you can get your crackers and your juice, and in the weeks to come, plan on taking communion every Sunday morning. I also want to remind you, at 11.30, right after this service, we've got our guest reception. We can't wait to see you there. Just click on that link on our online services page and we'll see you soon.